to the CESTIC webinar. Uh, Rob Ament, uh, a professor at Montana State University, will be presenting his results from his research project that was funded in part by the CESTIC Grant Center, as well as the Montana DOT, I believe. And he will be discussing the evaluation and of effectiveness and cost benefits of woolen roadside reclamation products. So, Rob, I will turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Vicki. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm glad you uh, joined us to uh, hear about uh, a three-year project where we explored different uh, potential products to use uh, that contained wool uh, for roadside reclamation purposes. And I want to thank Sestic for uh, hosting the webinar and supporting the project. Uh, the the progenitor of this idea was the Montana Department of Transportation, and they sustained it uh, for our research team for three years. I want to thank them, and as well as Casey Harvey Environmental, who was a subcontractor and helped uh, conduct the research and the field work. So um, I'll just briefly go through the, the project and some of its results. Um, Let's see if I can get, uh, there we go. Uh, so basically, uh, we were charged, there, there was some evidence that uh, wool, and, uh, wool was being used in other countries uh, to increase uh, veg vegetation establishment, uh, not just on roadsides, but for with horticultural applications and even uh, sod roofs. Uh, so uh, MDT was uh, interested in seeing if, uh, a, there were any products here in the U.S. that we could use uh, and do some demonstrations and research with, uh, or if we could import some of the products from abroad. And so we were to uh, d uh, develop and test these uh, different products as uh, after we did some exploration. Uh, and the reason wool uh, is considered a very... Uh, a good candidate for helping uh, plant reestablishment uh, after uh, roadside construction or disturbance was that, uh, for one thing, it uh, outperforms or holds way much more moisture. In the arid west, uh, often our, our, our young seedlings dry out, and so it was looked at where wool can store up to 400% of its uh, uh, weight uh, in water. Uh, it's way better than, for example, uh, coconut core, uh, which would be uh, about 80% by volume for moisture. So uh, the potential for wool to hold and make available to the young plants uh, moisture uh, either later in the day or uh, for, for more days after a, a rain event uh, was considered very promising. Uh, potential for using wool. The other thing about wool uh, is that it's a fertilizer, actually, as it breaks down. 17% of, uh, of, of wool is actually nitrogen, and often uh, for a roadside revegetation, uh, fertilizer is often needed because uh, of the poor quality of the, of the soils that um, the agencies are planting in. So um, uh, although all that nitrogen isn't available immediately, as the wool breaks down over time, the nitrogen would be released in a form that could be used by plants. Uh, and the other thing as we had done a preliminary, before we, uh, the project was accepted and we did some preliminary background work, uh, this was uh, uh, one of the sod, uh, sod roof uh, matrix uh, used in Germany, and uh, as you can see, the coconut uh, matrix, uh, which is sort of the standard product that's used uh, for erosion control blankets. Uh, usually, it's uh, core. It's called core or coconut uh, fibers uh, with straw, and uh, they compared that with using sheep wool, and you can see where the where the wool products 
were way outperforming uh, the coconut when it came to vegetative uh, coverage. And so this was very promising as well. And you'll also, I want to note on this that the lightest amount of sheep wool actually uh, compared to uh, some of the heavier amounts of sheep wool uh, actually had higher percent cover of vegetation. So although the heaviest uh, wool was, uh, did end up with the highest results. So anyhow, uh, we did want to look at different, like this project, in our project we looked at different um, uh, densities of wool or amounts of wool uh, per square area. And then we, as we looked around the world, we were seeing that uh, in some countries they were pelletizing wool and using it as a first fertilizer. Uh, this photo is uh, New Zealand where they were using pure, this is pure wool blankets uh, that were very dense. And so you can actually make wool so dense that instead of encouraging plant growth, it actually uh, suppresses weeds and, and any kind of growth so that uh, on this particular project they had containerized plants where they cut little openings in the very dense wool blankets. Uh, and then uh, they also use a, a combination of wool with sheep manure as fertilizer as well. So uh, all of these, uh, uh, the background information uh, that we did made it look very promising uh, that we wanted to try some things here uh, on along Montana roadsides. And so what we were specifically trying to do was identify which wool products would make the most sense for roadside applications. Then of those, we would actually do field tests. And then of those that were uh, outperformed the standard products being used today by MDT, uh, we would do a cost benefit analysis. And so that's what I'm going to uh, go through today. Uh, I don't wanna go into detail with uh, this whole list of products, but as you can see, we looked at uh, uh, international products, uh, we looked at some existing horticultural products that were used here in the U.S., and ultimately we ended up producing our own for this project uh, for a couple reasons that I'll explain in a moment. And so these are some of the things uh, we would get test swatches. This is from New Zealand. Uh, it's actually a very dense wool. Uh, this is called Wolch, which is sort of a wood fiber and wool fiber combo. Matt, uh, this actually uh, we found out was to suppress plants rather than to encourage their establishment. And then uh, a Montana wool mill actually made something. This is uh, very similar to the New Zealand product. Again, what we were finding were uh, all of the products that were currently being made were so dense as to um, uh, become plant suppressants and wouldn't be very useful for our our research project. Uh, so we ended up uh, learning a lot about wool production because we had to produce our own products, develop and produce our own products working in um, uh, hand in hand with three different wool uh, woolen mills here in Montana and then an erosion control blanket manufacturer uh, in Minnesota for the project. And just so when I use terms like scoured wool uh, these are scouring trains uh, that actually, this is where dirty wool shorn right off a sheep is actually run through a whole series of hot water vats to take all the lanolin, remove the lanolin, the wool, the dirt, uh, I'm sorry, the, the wax and, and oils on the, on the wool and, and dirt and feces and things like that. And also because of the hot, tr hot water treatment, it uh, gets rid of all the weed seeds. So uh, the, um, the clean product, that what's called scoured wool, uh, is actually hyperallergenic. And it's once you remove all those uh, oils and uh, waxes that uh, allows the wool to actually retain moisture rather than shed it. Because we wear a lot of wool clothes that supposedly gets rid of the, the moisture, but uh, uh, in fact, until you clean it like this, uh, it doesn't retain that 400% of its, its weight in water. And so this is just a, a quick picture of, of going in as dirty wool into a scouring train, 
This is the drying after it came, came out of the scouring train. And this is actually some of the product uh, we used on this research project. Uh, we were not uh, experts in wool production, so we really relied on the wool mills to, that we worked with to help us uh, determine uh, what to do and how to use their products. And, and these are, um, you'll hear about car, car, bats, wool bats or uh, carded bats. And so carding is uh, basically machines that uh, take those wool pieces and line up all the fibers relatively parallel to one another. Uh, so it's a carded wool is basically where all the wool is aligned via these different machines. Uh, and this is what a final product would look like. And we actually would get cut pieces of this in our, uh, you'll see in our field experiments uh, to look at different weights of wool to see which worked the best. Uh, and so we really had um, uh, no products that we could import uh, from foreign countries uh, or uh, that were really available here in the U.S. So we had to do a first season of te testing of products. We didn't know what the right weights and densities of the wool should be. Uh, we also wanted to add wool pieces to compost, and we didn't know how much to add. So we spent a summer basically experimenting with colors, uh, weights or densities, and then amounts uh, before we actually did field tests. And here uh, is a photo just so you can look at what, uh, after it's washed, scoured, and shredded, what uh, the wool product looks like up close because you don't get to touch any samples, which I have plenty of, but on a webinar you don't get, to, you don't get uh, uh, the tactile ex experience. And so what we found from that first summer is if the wool went on at too high of a density, it actually started suppressing a plant establishment. So it was very nice to know what, how many grams per meter squared we really wanted to work on uh, with the, the wool companies uh, to produce for our field studies in the subsequent years. So uh, at the end of that first uh, season, what we found was uh, uh, which products were we going to actually develop and field test. We found it was uh, too uh, difficult or some of the products that we wanted to obtain, they didn't even have import-export license with the U.S. and there were no foreign products currently available on the U.S. market that were promising, so we didn't get to test any of those. Um, that sometimes the wool capacity here in Montana, uh, the production is quite small and very limited. And uh, uh, some promises for wool materials when we'd ask uh, different companies, we'd like to acquire some to test and, and uh, get back to you. They just uh, would not follow up with us even though we offered to buy them. And then uh, so we focused on wool weights and densities more so than on manufacturing processes, uh, just because of you know limited extent of what we needed to do in just two years. And then the final uh, product selection was based on uh, that previous photo of the field testing of different swatches of material. Uh, Picorni Gardens is a very fancy name for one of our researchers' backyards. She had an acre and we tested it in her backyard. Uh, and so this is sort of a list of all these different products we reviewed. Uh, you can see there's a lot of no's, and the reason they're no's, we have comments on it. Uh, but what we did select were some of these uh, different types of uh, cut wool, felted wool, which uh, felting means you actually take the carded wool, which is all parallel fibers, and you stick needles uh, through it and pull them and move them uh, so you felt it and make it uh, stronger and tighter uh, material. So that's what felted wool is. And so we looked at other things and uh, ultimately we found an erosion control blanket manufacturer that would work with wool with us and I'll explain that in a moment. So uh, what we did was we also, before we went out into the field, we wanted to lab test the materials to make sure that they uh, were strong enough uh, that they'd ultimately hold up for what um, what Montana requires for roadside 
erosion control blankets. So we got the original run from the Minnesota manufacturer of some product, and then we sent those off to the labs, and they did a series of tests to meet uh, MD MDT, which is basically also AASHTO or any other state, very similar requirements for erosion control blankets. Uh, and ultimately, uh, after all, uh, the tests, uh, we only did one replication because it was quite expensive, over, I think, $11,000. Uh, three tests are, are normal if you're a, a business, uh, but uh, we just did one set, and we found that it did meet uh, most of the tensile strength standards for short-term or long-term. So it was fairly strong, uh, and it exceeded some shear stress uh, specified in the standard for short-term erosion control blankets but not for high-level events for like really gully washers, as they call them, uh, or big storm events. So, uh, and the, the, the C factor uh, was uh, also met uh, type two uh, erosion control blanket uh, requirements by MDT. So overall, given it was only one test and not the full complement of three, it was very promising that uh, uh, wool in these uh, erosion control blankets uh, could meet, uh, ultimately meet uh, standards that would be required by a DOT. And so at the end of our, our first year, this is what we, after looking and trying and testing, we came up with the following uh, uh, four different areas that we wanted to uh, explore. The first was uh, the wool silk fence. Uh, we thought we could make it strong enough. Uh, it was 100% biodegradable and currently might be able to be used where the, the existing standard is woven plastic that doesn't decompose. And so there might be situations where 100% uh, biodegradable silk fence might be needed. Uh, the second one was the erosion control blankets. Uh, these were pure wool sort of like what we saw in New Zealand, uh, and they were either wool bats or needle punch to make them stronger uh, bats. That's a misspelling, sorry. And then uh, also to use pieces of wool uh, mixed with uh, the standard compost used on roadside reclamation. And then ultimately we got into standard product development of rolled erosion troll blankets, where we worked with a manufacturer and came up with different wool straw weights uh, that I'll be showing you in a moment for the field test. And that these were the products that we did the lab test on, the 50% wool, 50% straw rolled erosion control blanket. So uh, the first product was silk fence. We thought, oh, they look pretty easy. Uh, you just stitch the bats together and put them up, and now we have 100% biodegradable uh, silk fence. But uh, and we had a nice uh, location where they had just recently completed construction along U.S. Highway 12, and so we set up four or five different uh, uh, fences along that, uh, all of the same product, and uh, ultimately it sags. As you can see, uh, it wasn't uh, uniform. There was inconsistent uh, material density across the entire. Uh, uh, length or width of the product, and ultimately, just like uh, a very wet sweater, uh, it, it ends up sagging, and so it just didn't have the internal strength that would be needed to be uh, ready to go. Uh, and so, after a, a year, uh, or the, by the fall, after all the storms of the year, we could see that we needed to go back to the drawing board and get some strengthener put into the to the the wool felt, uh, and so we had a, a, a tent making company here in town do different types of stitching, and then we also tried to add maybe in between two layers of wool felt, we added some, uh, this happened to be plastic, we would ultimately use a, a biodegradable mesh, but some kind of mesh to try to strengthen it. Uh, we put that out the next year to see how well that would hold up. And uh, as you can see, it was starting to sag equally uh, and basically had failed by the end of the, of the growing season. So then we went back on the third year, and instead of using wool, 
uh, as the, the complete product, this is actually burlap bag material with a wool layer at the lower end to filter the silt. And so we thought the burlap would give it strength and the wool would give it the filtering uh, effect and it's still 100% biodegradable. Um, and ultimately, uh, that material um, didn't hold up very well either. And so we had three versions and, uh, and we concluded that it just needed a lot more work than what we could give it uh, attention to in the, as just one part of this relatively uh, initial uh, development study. So then the next thing we wanted to do was look at uh, the different products in a, a field test. And this is a, a location on Highway US 287. And you can see it had failed. This had been an old construction site. They tried to re-veg it, and it had been done very poorly, or it had mostly weeds. And so we thought we would take our products and, and try it in a harsh site where already uh, MDT had tried to re-veg and had failed, and would the wool products help uh, in these very uh, unforgiving uh, environments. Uh, so we tested it here, and I'll be talking about this is a compost uh, 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 test uh, area. Each is one meter squared. This is the compost with wool pieces. You can see the standard coconut straw ECB that everyone uses today. And then you can see all these different combinations of different types of wool products, which I'll explain in a moment but at least you can visualize what uh, I'm talking about when I explain some of these different products. Uh, and so what we did was we uh, wanted to uh, test these by uh, measuring the vegetative uh, cover of the, of the actual seed mix that we put down under the blankets, the erosion control blankets or the compost with wool. Um, and was it yeah, and was it statistically significant? So we did a power analysis, and that's how we came up. We had done some previous erosion control blanket uh, and vegetative studies for MDT, and so uh, using that previous information, we developed a power analysis and came up with we needed uh, 11 replicates to get statistical power, hopefully. And then the second piece, uh, besides the ECBs, is we wanted to look at compost as well and do the same thing, test compost as the control versus compost with wool pieces. And due to our previous summer, we knew the relative rate to, uh, of wool to compost. Uh, and so this is uh, just some quick pictures as we were establishing the plots. And then to make everything the same, uh, we put a, a mesh, a biodegradable uh, cotton mesh uh, over every single treatment just so that it was consistent. And it was a windy site, so we didn't want to lose uh, compost or wool pieces or other material. And so this is uh, what it looked like uh, after we got done setting up all the different randomized plots. Uh, and uh, somewhere, up, so it was a, a block, uh, random block design. So as you can see, some treatments are at the bottom of the slope, some were at the top of the slope, so it varied. Some were on the east and some were to the west. So we varied it across the slope, and we used the same. This is a typical perennial grass seed mix uh, that MDT uses, so uh, we use the same seed mix on all our test sites uh, at, uh, the uh, at, at a, a, a seeding rate that uh, uh, the MDT reclamation specialist uses. So we're just trying to basically uh, mimic what MDT does for roadside reclamation when it comes to seed mix. And so here were the different treatments. We had a lot of controls, as you can see, four different controls, but we did have uh, six different uh, ECB, potential ECB, I should say. Some were uh, the carded wool blats, some were needle punched, uh, at different passes, meaning at different strengths. If they got too tough, we were afraid they might suppress plants. Uh, and then we also had uh, the, the rolled erosion control blankets that were developed uh, in Minnesota at the, by that manufacturer. 
So these four were from wool. The first four products were from wool companies here in Montana. The other two were from the Minnesota manufacturer. And then, of course, we tried the wool compost at a 40 to 1 ratio. So uh, uh, originally, uh, at the previous summer at the test site, we did 20 to 1 and 40 to 1. It was quite clear that we didn't need to put that much wool into the compost. And just to give you an idea, when I talk about uh, the manufactured erosion control blankets, you can see where uh, this is a, a view of the actual production of some of our uh, wool straw ECBs. This was a, a pure wool ECB being built, and this one is actually one of their standard uh, straw coconut ECBs being made. So they were able to just put different wool and straw combos ratios in their hoppers to get the different mixes of, of how much of wool to straw uh, for us to test in the field. So basically, from this site, we have traditional products that, uh, I mean, products that could be simply replacing uh, the standard coconut ones with wool ones. It was all made at the same dimensions. You could make 100-foot rolls just like a traditional product. And uh, again, because you can't feel or touch these today, I tried to give you a close-up. This shows you a 64 wool combo, uh, and this is the jute uh, netting that's on the two sides. And the ratio 60 to 4, 40 is weight of uh, straw, wool to straw in the layer between the two uh, net nets. So you can see a net on top, there's a net on bottom, and then you have your mix. Uh, and we have uh, we tried different ratios of that uh, straw to wool mix. And so going back to uh, long to use some of these one meter sections to be consistent instead of full rolls, uh, we we laid them out on US 287. And you can see after one year, we just uh, some vegetation was coming in. Uh, there's a saying that you uh, sleep, creep, and leap. It's the first year. You basically don't have anything. The second year, you start getting some vegetative establishment, and then the leap year is when you really start getting uh, some uh, vegetative cover. And so you can see after one year, we didn't see a whole lot of uh, veg cover. But by the second year, you can see we're getting very robust uh, coverage on the site uh, with that seed mix. And so these are the results uh, from testing those six different uh, products, uh, erosion control blankets, and then looking at the uh, compost and compost with wool. And so uh, instead of going through every single uh, thing, uh, I'm going to point out what's highlighted uh, to show you. This would, if, if uh, MDT would have done their standard coconut. Uh, erosion control blanket over their perennial grass seed mix, uh, they would have gotten 4.7% cover of the seeded grasses uh, after two years. But if they would have used uh, either the 50-50 wool straw ECB or the 100% wool uh, ECB, they would have got four to five times more vegetative cover of that which they seeded. So you can see we're, this is a significant increase in vegetative cover by using the, the manufactured ones. And even if they would have used uh, the different carded ones made by the, the, the wool companies, uh, they were all above the 4.7 except one. And that was where when it was needle punched, meaning four passes, four times, it got so tough or strong that it was hard for plants to probably penetrate through the felted wool. But ultimately, almost every single one but one product, by having wool in it, had higher a cover of the seeded grass mix. Uh, the second one, desired, these would be volunteer seeds that are either in the seed bank or that came in on, uh, via the wind, uh, which were really just sort of a mix of information there, but we did categorize it. And there's not much of a story to tell there. Then the other thing we wanted to look at were the weed species. Um, 
we were feeling that uh, most weeds are, are broadleafs, and so the cotyledons might not be able to make it up through the wool uh, because of the, the, the density of the wool. So it might suppress weeds compared to uh, the traditional uh, type of uh, coconut core uh, ECB. And so again, if you look at what uh, they had, uh, this again, if MDT would have used standard product, they would have had 17.7% cover in weeds, uh, and only four of preferred what they planted. If they would have used these new products uh, from the, manufac the manufactured erosion control blankets, you can see they had less weed cover in both products uh, compared to what uh, is standard today. Now, we did want to do statistical tests on these differences in means, and so what we did was pair-wide t-test, and that means uh, we would compare each product with each other product. And so the p-values I have here for the seeded native grass uh, are p-values when compared to the control of coconut, uh, um, uh, the standard coconut uh, blanket versus the wool blankets that we produced. And you can see we had such low p-values that, that these differences of four to five times more vegetation are statistically significant. However, uh, when we looked at the weed differences of 10.8 to 17.7 or 13.6 to 17.7, the p-values are high, so high that we really don't have any, they're not statistically uh, different. So we can say a lot at least for this, we can statistically say these are significantly different uh, when it comes to the vegetation you want to establish. However, the suppression of weeds, although different, uh, was not statistically different. And then the last part of the story of the field test uh, at 287 was comparing the compost with cut wool versus just compost alone. And as you can see, again, the wool had about a 60% increase uh, in uh, preferred seeded native grass, what you planted, uh, by just adding the cut wool pieces into it. Uh, it also had a bit more um, weed cover, uh, probably because of the nitrogen effect or the moisture holding effect of the wool. So you have more vegetation establishing when you use the cut wool. However, again, comparing the cut wool uh, to the control of compost only, the p-values for both seeded and uh, weeds uh, was not statistically uh, different. So we, again, it's promising, but we don't have any statistical power to say it was it was more, but it, uh, it was 60% more, but that wasn't necessarily statistically significant. So then what we wanted to do, we had another field test of the the erosion control blankets. These just jumped out at us we were, uh, and really made uh, a wool something that could be commercially available almost immediately. You could go into production at any erosion control blanket manufacturing plant and put wool into your hoppers and, and be producing this kind of product if as a manufacturer you were interested. So we wanted to, we have a test uh, slope uh, at our research facility in Lewiston, uh, Montana. And what we wanted to do is try different combinations of wool uh, ratios and compare that to the standard coconut straw. On this, uh, this is, there's no topsoil on this slope. Again, we wanted, and it's, uh, we, we built it so it's uh, south facing, uh, so it's the harsh, dry, and very poor soil. Uh, and we thought, well, if wool could help plant establishment, that would be great. Uh, it could only get better in nicer sites. So as you can see, we did, again, random blocks. We had 10 replications, so we just kept going down. Uh, these are five meters long uh, by two meters wide, and we did 10 reps of all the different types as well as the control and ran it for 100, 100 meter, uh, this whole slope is 100 meters long. So we were able to have total control over 
our um, randomization and our, our different types of wool combos compared to the coconut. And uh, this is, again, after year one, you can see there's a lot of weedy species established in year one and two. It's such a harsh site. Um, and what we were, uh, the results from this showed, uh, we just weren't getting anything that was significant. Uh, and the seeded grasses, it took two years before they even began uh, to establish. And, uh, and the wool was starting to decompose by the second year uh, to start providing sort of a nitrogen effect, I guess, or a fertilization effect. Uh, but again, we had no statistical significant differences in any of the treatments after two years. Uh, so we extended the project so we could go back a third year, and these are the third year results. Um, so what you can see is that, um, again, let's go to the control, which is the, the coconut. Uh, you'll see that we had, uh, this, of the seeded perennial grass mix, uh, there was 28% cover under coconut. If you had the pure wool, again, uh, only a 4% uh, uh, more uh, preferred veg cover than the standard. And as you can see, some of the wool were underperforming the standard, but the 50 50, relatively 50 50 one that we had used at the other site uh, also was uh, 32. So if you remember 50 50 and 100 at uh, the previous field test site outperformed the coconut, these two mixtures. Uh, again, outperformed it by trying to go to lighter amounts of wool. It seems like uh, it was unsuccessful. So somewhere between 50 and 100% seems to help uh, plant establishment. Although again, we did not get statistical significance on these. And then both the non-seeded and the weed seeds, uh, uh, weedy, weedy species covers were quite similar and. Uh, there wasn't much of a story to tell about that. It was sort of a wash, six, six, and and uh, the and five, so uh, five percent cover. So uh, weeds, there was no difference. Uh, there again was more coverage in the 50-50 and the hundred, but that we could not determine a significant, statistically significant more amount of cover. So what you can see is look at the vegetation that came in by the third year compared to what I showed you a picture of previously of just one and two years. So uh, it does take some time before the plants get established uh, and you get incredible cover. Uh, and But what was interesting is uh, I wanted to show you these are the 2016 results versus 2017. And look at the weed speed seed coverage. It went from 29 down to 4, 31 down to 6, 30 down to 6, uh, and a significant decrease in the weed species in one year, and then of the planted, significant uh, 20 or 30 percent increases, uh, 20 to 30 percent increases in cover of the seeded native grass. So it really did go from sleep to creep to a big leap by year three. Um, and we're unsure if the if the weed reduction was due to someone spraying it. But there's a contractor that sprays the around the roads and in the facility and might have treated this slope, or if it was due to competition with the seeded, seeded native grasses. But the story still was that um, the 50/50 and the 100% uh, wool ECBs did out did have more cover in what we wanted, which was the seeded grass species. And the other thing we found after three years was there was still some bits and pieces of wool. You can see it right here. It takes about three years uh, for the, the, the erosion control blanket to decompose, which really does provide uh, quite a bit of good cover, but also means that over three years, the wool slowly breaking down and releasing it nitrogen into the soils. And so then the other thing we wanted to do was look at the cost benefit of using these wool straw combos. Again, we focused on the 70% uh, standard coconut ECB 
and the 50 and the 100. Uh, if the less wool you use, you know it's going to cost less than straw. So uh, the 50-50 we compared, this was from the site where we had statistical difference. That was the first field test area along uh, US Highway 287. And what we found was it cost, uh, we worked with the manufacturer about buying wool versus buying coconut and putting it into the ECBs and manufacturing it. And so this is the manufacturer cost. Uh, it includes shipping for production. In other words, bringing the wool that was cleaned here in Montana back to Minnesota for, for production purposes uh, and um, where they don't bring coconut from here, they, they get it through their traditional means. Um, and what we found was the, uh, I'm sorry, I have this in the wrong place. Uh, this is actually includes shipping for production, uh, the same as with the wool too. So we did try for him, ask him to include cost of getting it to Minnesota, regardless of it, whether it was the coconut or the wool. And what you f we found was uh, by using wool at a 50-50 com 50-50 uh, ratio that it costs uh, just slightly under twice as much. So the initial cost of buying the ECB uh, is twice as much if you use a 50-50 mix uh, in your ECB. However, if you so that's one way of looking cost just at the upfront uh, installation cost, but if you look at how much cover, uh, responding cover you get by using the wool, remember it had four to five times more cover than the coconut, and you look at the cost of buying this with the response of how much cover you get, then actually the 50-50 uh, straw ECB costs about five cents uh, for each percent vegetative cover per meter squared for each one of those test meter squareds that we set up. Uh, and if you use the traditional, it's cheaper up front, but you also get so much less vegetation cover that it actually costs more for each percent veg cover. Again, because you're only getting one fourth or one fifth of the veg cover that you're getting uh, for the 50-50 straw. So you can look at the, have a results cost or an upfront installation cost. And if you look at it this way, it's expensive. If you look at it this way, the results are worth investing in, even though it costs more upfront. And then this was not part of the project. I've done this subsequently because we forgot to add, or we didn't, at that time that we didn't add wool as a fertilizer. Like how much money would it save if you use wool uh, versus use coconut and then have to fertilize as well. Well, it, uh, so this is a very uh, busy uh, uh, slide. I, I um, apologize for this, but um, the bottom line is uh, I looked at some traditional, if you put send your soil sample in, uh, the lab returns it and it says, uh, you need to apply three pounds of nitrogen. This is a very typical poor soil here in the Northern Rockies. Uh, and they, the, such a lab, but when you get your lab results, if you're uh, uh, doing a reclamation project along the highway, and they say, well, you need three pounds of nitrogen, well, that's for 1,000 square feet uh, of area. The equivalent is you need to apply 130 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So uh, if you use a coconut, you would have to pay not only for the for the fertilizer, but also to put it out, to apply it as well. Uh, and there's all different types from you know, liquid ammonium like agriculture uses to granulated uh, broadcast types uh, of uh, fertilizer. But if you use a 50, the 5050 wool straw ECB, it basically produces um, 411 pounds of, uh, per acre of nitrogen uh, when you uh, put the wool ECB. So you can see it's about three times as much. But if you remember from my previous slide, it takes about three years for the nitrogen to decompose. So basically what that says is, you're getting about 130 pounds per year 
from the nitrogen uh, in the wool blankets uh, being released or decomposed and released and made available to plants each and every year. While you may pay for fertilizer for one year because it uh, is very mobile um, and readily available, and then it disappears by the second year, most of it does, uh, with wool, you're actually getting a, a fer the same fertilizer effect year one, year two, and year three. And in part, this may uh, be um, uh, a rationale for why we were seeing higher levels of veg cover uh, by year three uh, with the wool blankets than we were with the coconut blankets. So uh, I guess that's the last slide. And um, that basically uh, is the whole project. That, uh, and in summary, the the silt fence uh, was very complicated, and really, we I believe you could make uh, a wool-based uh, erosion. I'm sorry, silt fence uh, that's 100% biodegradable. But it would take it takes more for manufacturers to continue to work that out and get it really down to cost effective. Burlap's very cheap and might be the type of material to be working with more so than wool. The second product that we really wanted to look like look at was could we add wool pieces to compost? Clearly, you were seeing a response rate of 60% more. It was only one test site. Yes, it was 11 replicates of each, uh, but we still did not find that the amount, the 60% more, was statistically significant. We believe that uh, that's an easy uh, product to explore further about the right uh, combos and uh, do enough field testing to get some statistical power behind it. For the erosion control blanket, it became clear to us that uh, economically you, do, uh, you wouldn't want to use pure wool blankets like what the wool uh, mills here in Montana produce for us. It just would be prohibitively expensive. Uh, and even though you could get a higher vegetative response rate, uh, it would, it, it just, you, you couldn't afford to pay for it ultimately. However, but by just using cut pieces of wool and mixing it in with straw in a traditional rolled erosion control blanket, uh, it, it, it'll most likely, it'll meet the type two erosion control blanket uh, requirements or uh, specifications of DOTs. It might, with a little further exploration and more testing, uh, hit type three erosion control blanket uh, um, specifications. And if so, we, we demonstrated uh, that it can outperform. It certainly always gets more vegetative cover, whether it's the Statistically significant, we found it in one area on one test site and not the other. So again, it's not absolutely overwhelming evidence, but there's a lot of good information here that demonstrates that wool uh, in, com in smaller amounts, but yet uh, some, basically 50-50 means eight ounces of wool per square meter of material, uh, could give you uh, much higher vegetative cover. And again, we only tested it in Montana environments. Um, and that's only one type of place. We never were able to go to, say, the arid uh, intermountain basin where cheatgrass is problematic and where dryness, uh, cheatgrass robs the soil of the moisture before the native plants can establish, or any other uh, type of uh, challenging roadside uh, uh, project where you're trying to reestablish vegetation. So uh, what we feel it, it, we concluded was it, it, it definitely provides a benefit. Uh, we can show in one instance where it was statistically different, it also is economically uh, uh, justifiable. And uh, on another, we didn't. So. I guess you could say we had somewhat mixed results, not overwhelming results, but almost every time we used, as you saw, when we used some wool, it was outperforming the coconut products. Thank you. Now I'm uh, available for any questions.
Anybody have questions, you either can raise your hand. I can unmute everybody if you all want to try talking at, my, at once and see if there are any questions. Any questions? Okay. Well, thank you, Rob. I uh, will stop recording now. And um, thank you all for coming.